Peter, so thank you for the invitation to speak here, as well as the wonderful trip you put together. It's been very informative to figure out how can we implement pharmacogenomics into a healthcare system here in Taiwan. As I continue to talk about this uh, topic, what I want you guys to think about is all of those ideas that Jack talked about, those are overarching of this concept. This is just one use case for all of those ideas. So just keep some of those themes in mind um, as we move forward here. So this is a comic that was published in The New Yorker, a very common magazine in the United States. And I want somebody in the audience to guess when was this published? So what year did the public see this idea? So this is a patient going to the pharmacist with a piece of paper and saying, here's my sequence. The idea is the pharmacist would then do something with that. So when did this happen? Somebody guess. 2002. Anybody else? All right, so it's 2001, so you're very accurate, right? So that's more than 15 years ago. I can tell you this does not happen today in the United States, probably because it's not the right idea. The idea that you're going to have your whole sequence on a piece of paper that you could transport, probably not reasonable. How would you, we still have to figure out how we're going to transport this data. I think Alan hopefully will talk a little bit about that later. The idea that the pharmacist knows what to do with the data once they get that. The education is going to be a huge problem. And also, does the patient even know that this is an information that I need to take to my pharmacist. So there's patient education as well. Uh, we, we've gotten closer, but we're still very far away from this idea. So what does pharmacogenomics look like in practice? So based on evidence-based medicine, you group uh, patients that are similar together, and you see them the same way, and you're going to treat them the same way. So this represents all of the patients a physician is going to see that are 50 years old, have a family history of cardiovascular disease, and they're at an annual wellness, and they have high blood pressure. The physician sees all those patients the same, they're gonna do the same thing, because that's what the guidelines say. And what happens, they give them a medication. For most patients represented here in green, they're gonna get the benefit from the drug with little to no toxicity, and everything's going to be fine. For some patients represented in the gray here, they're going to get no benefit whatsoever. So they're going to come back to their doctor in six months and still have high blood pressure, and the doctor's going to have to decide, what do I do next? And then there are going to be patients, represented in the red here, who have toxicity or adverse events from those medications. And in some cases, it's also not working. So you've got the worst of both worlds there. Um, and these patients are going to be a challenge. Because what does the physician do next? But we only know these outcomes once we give the patient the medication based on how we practice today. If you implement pharmacogenomic testing before you give a patient a medication, that blue group becomes very different. Now you're beginning to identify patients before you ever give them that medication, if they're likely to respond to the medication, or if they're likely to have side effects or not respond to it. And if you know that data before you prescribe, you can get to precision, personalized, individualized, translational medicine, whatever term you want to get to it, but at the end of the day, it's better patient care. So the patients that are going to respond normally get standard of treatment, that's most patients, and then patients that are likely to have uh, toxicity or no effect may get a different dose or may get a different drug. We live in an era where we have many options for treating any one condition, so maybe we don't have to get to the point that we're going to precision dosing where this patient gets 81 milligrams of a medication, this other patient gets 79 milligrams of that medication, but instead we use medication A and medication B. Trying to avoid a problem if we can, as opposed to trying to tackle the problem. And if you do this appropriately, what does it lead to? It leads to safer, more effective drug therapy, increased adherence to drug therapy, and in increased adherence to drug therapy is very, very important because this is probably the only thing that is black and white in medicine. And that is, if a patient doesn't take a medication, it's never going to help that patient. Everything else is probably up for debate, but that thing is definitely true. And we know for many health conditions, if patients take their medications, we can decrease hospitalizations, and then in a population, you decrease health care costs. 
So I'm going to share with you a case of a, a patient who came into my clinic for pharmacogenomic testing, and I'm going to walk you through how we use this to help clarify that one, pharmacogenomics is not a crystal ball, and two, that you have to incorporate genomic data into everything else you're thinking about with that patient. It doesn't replace anything, but it's more data and more knowledge to improve prescribing. So this was a 13-year-old female who came into my office with her mother. She had been diagnosed with depression and anxiety. She had been on multiple medications for 18 months. The mother talked about having to give her daughter poison every night before she goes to bed because that's how the mom sees the medication because it's never worked and she seems to continue to get worse uh, as she takes more medication. So very simply, here are the medications they've tried. Um, the first three are very common antidepressants. Uh, the, the fourth one is um, an antipsychotic which can be used to help treat depression as well. And the fifth is another common antidepressant. In the middle column, we represent the patient's response. So the red X is it didn't work at all. The yellow X, it kind of worked. Uh, and then for side effects, green means there were no side effects whatsoever. And the red X means side effects to the point that she pretty much stopped taking the medication. So representing here, all of these drugs did not work. We did a multi-gene panel for this patient. And this is one of the hallmarks of our program is every patient gets a multi-gene panel so that when they incur the expense of doing the testing, we get a lot of information that we can use over the course of the patient's life because this data doesn't change. It's the DNA that you inherited from your mom and your dad. And so if I tested you when you were born, if I tested you when you were 20, and I tested you when you died, as long as I use the same testing platform, I would get the same answer. So we got this large panel. Only three results were applicable to this particular case, but everything else will be stored. From this data, we translate it into simple recommendations or simple understandings. So two drug metabolizing enzymes, CYP2D6, she is a poor metabolizer. This means she has lower or almost no function in that particular enzyme. 2C19, she is an intermediate metabolizer, meaning reduced but does retain some activity. And for a presynaptic serotonin transporter, SLC6A4, she has a mutation which suggests she's not going to respond very well to SSRIs and also um, have side effects related to those. So that's what her genetics said. Let's go back to the drugs that she tried. What did, how did the genetics relate to that? So for the first medication, uh, that is an SSRI. The genetic results suggested it wouldn't work for her and she'd get side effects. You go back to the picture from earlier, that's what happened with her, it didn't work. Uh, the same thing for sertraline, um, fluoxetine, aripiprazole, and venlafaxine. So for every medication the doctor used in routine practice, there was a genetic reason for that not to work, but the doctor didn't know about it for those 18 months that they were prescribing. We made a recommendation to consider a different drug class, SNRIs, and we gave some examples, uh, desvenilafaxine, duloxetine, and uh, bupropion to treat this patient. So one of the things here is it wasn't, this is the medication you use and go forward and everything's going to be fine. We're, we're not there yet, maybe in the future. So the doctor took this information, tried bupropion with an additional medication. For one month, the patient failed. Then they went back and tried duloxetine and another medication. And for the last 18 months, this pa patient has returned to more of a normal lifestyle, doing well in school, interacting with their friends after school. The mom doesn't talk about poison anymore. Does anybody want to guess why they chose bupropion for this patient to begin with? It was cost. This medication was cheaper for that patient on their insurance plan, so they thought, if it would work, let's save them more money, right? Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work, so we had to go to another agent. But this is the idea that genomics doesn't lead everything else. We have to think about the whole patient, right? All right, so I've just sold you on how wonderful pharmacogenomics is and what it can do. How do you begin to implement it, and how do you begin to develop a system where we can begin to create the data that will then go into the learning healthcare system? The first step is identifying the key players that are going to be involved in the process. These are both people that are going to support it and then the people that are actually going to do the work. So the stakeholders here are going to be the people that support it. And you need support from the top down in your organization as well as the bottom up 
and in the middle out as well. And everybody has to be on board. Pharmacogenomics is not easy. It takes resources, and it's going to take time to figure out the best way to do it. So you can't say, here's six months, and if you don't have something in six months, we're not going to do it anymore. You have to have a lot of support to be able to build the program. And then personnel. These are the people you're going to need to be able to do the, the work. So you need somebody who can lead the program. Then you're going to need physician champions who are interested in it, have bought into the value of pharmacogenomics, and will begin to use it in their practice. One of the things we've seen at North Shore is as physicians use it, they talk to their colleagues and tell them about the good cases they've had, and now their colleagues become more interested, and they tell their colleagues, and it continues to grow kind of organically without much constraint and uh, much education in our part. We do a lot of targeted education, but we do see users outside of that targeted education beginning to use our program. I think interesting here, patients are the only people that show up in both. You have to have patients interested and willing to do pharmacogenomic testing if you're going to uh, do the program. And I think here in Taiwan, especially at uh, Taipei Medical University, you have that type of setting where patients will be interested in this data. All right, so you've got everybody on board. Now it's time to begin to do the work. So what do we think about? So key three steps, three key steps for clinical implementation. So the first is you have to obtain the data. Then you have to in translate or interpret the data, and then you have to return that data back to the patient and the provider. And I'm going to walk through some key questions and key ideas to think about related to each of those. So for obtaining the data, you have to answer these five questions. Who, what, when, where, why? So you have to figure out who you're going to test, what are you going to test, when are you going to do it in the course of treatment, where is the test actually going to occur, and then ultimately why are you doing it. I think we've already answered the why with the case and how we want to integrate it in practice, so I'll skip that, but let's move on here. So the who and the what to test. For pharmacogenomics to have impact, you have to have a population that has the genetic variant and the population that are receiving the drugs that are linked to those genetic variants, and that overlap is where you get benefit. So the question is, how big is that overlap? Because if it's only one or two percent of your population, maybe you don't care about doing this. You don't have time to, do the, to give the resources and the effort and the manpower to be able to do it. So let's first look at the, who has the genetic variation. So I'll ask you guys another question. This is from a US perspective. This is where the data is. Um, but what percent of the population has a high risk genetic variant for pharmacogenomics? And by high risk, I mean one in which if a patient carries this and receives the corresponding medication, I want to alter therapy in some way. So it may just be that the medication is less likely to work. We're not talking about high risk in Stephen Johnson's every case, okay? So who thinks it's A, 5% of the population has a high risk variant? Got a couple votes there. B, 20%. Got some more. C, 77%. All right, and D, 99%. All right, everybody got it wrong. The answer is D, 99% of the population is calculated to have one of these variants. This is data from our clinic at North Shore, which is a mostly Caucasian population. 98% of patients have at least one uh, actionable variant or high-risk variant. And what you'll see here is that most patients not just not only have one, but have two, three, and four variants. So this is why you want to do that multi-gene panel, because you're getting a lot of information that can be very useful at one time. So you guys might be saying, well, maybe this is just a Caucasian um, problem and it doesn't apply to the Asian population. So if we look at some comparators for common uh, drug metabolizing enzymes, I've represented high-risk variants versus normal-risk variants. And uh, it's the Caucasian on the left and the Asian on the right. And you'll notice that for each gene, there is a little bit of difference. But overall, especially once you start thinking about 2C19, you do see that probably you're around the same percentage if you start to add it up and do the math. Especially with 2C19, that's a really important one, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So now let's think about the drugs. So we know that the circle for the population is huge, it's basically everybody. Now how often are we using those drugs? So these are the common medications that have very strong um, evidence 
evidence-based medicine to what to do with the genomic information if you have it. And I've brought back those little guys from earlier. So the red represents times where we know the genetic link is about adverse events, and the gray is about the uh, genetic risk for the medication not working. I don't know the data in Taiwan, but I've been told by several people that these are very commonly used medications um, in Taiwan, and they're very commonly used medications in the United States. And they're not limited to any one disease state. So we have some cardiovascular medications, we have some rheumatology medications, we have psychiatric medications, chemotherapy, um, immunosuppressants, uh, seizure medications. So it's all over the healthcare uh, setting. It's not like you can pick out one and say, this is the only place that pharmacogenomics is going to be valuable. And you'll see that 2C19 shows up one, two, three, maybe four times on, on this, five times here. So it's used quite a lot, and this is one of the areas where we have the highest amount of variation in the Asian population. So to give you an idea of numbers, at the North Shore system, it's about a million drug orders in our healthcare system. So both inpatient and outpatient. If you look at the US outpatient prescription population, it's about 750 million opportunities to make a difference in some patient's life if you implement pharmacogenomics in a large system. So we know that, so that 750 million represents about 20% of the drug market being used in any year. So we have 99% of patients have it and 20% of the drugs. So it probably doesn't make sense to test everybody if we're only talking about 20% of the drugs. So how do we begin to identify populations where we want to do this? Well, there was a paper published not too long ago in the United States. It looked at prescription records for about 73 million patients. And what we saw is at almost a coin flip, so 50% uh, of patients who are 65 or older get at least one new for, uh, prescription for a pharmacogenomically high-risk medication. And so it's very important that it's a new medication because if I've given you a medication for six months, we've already done the experiment in you. We know how you're going to respond, right? You went back to the physician and they said, oh, your blood pressure's still high, we've got to do something else. You stopped taking the medication because it's giving you muscle pain and it makes it so you can't walk around during the day and enjoy your life. So you've already done the experiment, pharmacogenomics less valuable in that setting. But if we can have it ahead of time, now we can avoid those bad things and get to quicker, more effective drug therapy. To show you this data in another setting, this is a heat map showing you that if you're very young, you're really not likely to be on a pharmacogenomic high-risk drug, and you're likely not to be on multiple, but as you age, you're likely to be on more, and patients tend to be on two or three or four of these. As we've seen in the United States, polypharmacy or multiple drugs for any one patient is very, very common. So this would be an ideal population to go after. If you pick somebody who was 50, relatively healthy, you do the test, and in the next four years, you're probably going to use that data in their care. So that's the who and the what. So the question is when. So there's two different uh, camps in pharmacogenomics. There's reactive versus preemptive. So by reactive, we're talking about waiting until you have a problem and then ordering the pharmacogenomic test. This tends to lend itself to ordering one gene at a time. So the classic example would be a patient who needs carbamazepine and ordering an HLA uh, B1502 uh, analysis to see if they're gonna be at risk for Steven Johnson syndrome. Or a Bacavir and another HLA. Those are the very common ways. Another one that's very common is warfarin and ordering pharmacogenomics related to that. The more robust way of doing it and now becoming the more common way of doing it is doing it preemptively where you test them because you can, and you have the data and the record, and then you drive it to the clinician at the time that they need it. And this has become more well accepted now because we have better clinical decision support tools, we have better ways of delivering this information to a clinician, and it's cheaper now for us to get all of this information at one time. So for the cost of doing one or two genes by themselves, I can do a panel of 20, 30, 50 genes. So we've got scales of economy at that point. So the where, you might think this is a pretty simple question. Where are you doing in the doctor's office, right? They come in and they swap your cheek. Well, at North Shore, 
we said maybe we shouldn't, maybe there's another way of doing this. So we actually allow patients to swab themselves at their house because it's convenient for them. All they have to do is take what looks like a really long Q-tip and rub it on the inside of your cheek for a minute. You don't have to go to medical school to figure that one out, right? So very easy for patients to do. So the question of where is even um, one that has many, many answers and one that I challenge you guys to come up with an interesting way of doing it that fits the patient's uh, needs and, the, and what the patient wants. So interpreting the data, this gets a little bit more into the learning health system. There are multiple steps for interpreting pharmacogenomic data. The first is you have to come up with the genotype data. So take the uh, beta plot or the phosphorescence image and come up with an actual genotype that would be present. Then in pharmacogenomics, unlike every other type of genomics, the genotype's not good enough. Now we translate it into this thing called star alleles, which represents a haplotype. Uh, you get one from your mom, one from your dad, so you get a diplotype. So we begin to describe patients as star one, star two for a given enzyme. For example, um, anybody raise their hand if they know what a 2D6 star five, star five, if a patient has that genotype, what does it mean for them? Does anybody know? Okay, that's the exact same thing that happens in the United States when I ask that question. Nobody knows. So we then translate it to something that's a little bit easier, the phenotype. So for somebody that is a CYP2D6 star 5 star 5, they are a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer. You begin to figure out what a poor metabolizer is, right? That's somebody who has little to no function. So we could deliver this information to a provider and it would make a little bit of sense, but they probably don't care about that until we can get to where the rubber meets the road, where we can make a therapeutic recommendation and say something like, this patient is likely not to respond to codeine because they can't activate it. Please choose another pain relieving medication, analgesic. So that's the process, but what does it really look like? Well, this is the data that comes off the machine. These are the genotypes, and we turn it into this. A couple of sentences that tell the clinician very quickly, here's what it means and here's how to use it. This is something they can understand and use and read in the time in which the, physician, the patient is still in front of them. Right? They only have 15 minutes with their patient. You can read this in a few minutes and know what to do when you want to treat your patient. So there is a group and some resources out that are freely available to everyone to help facilitate this process of going from the genotype data all the way to the therapeutic recommendation. So PharmGKB is the website, PharmGKB.org. And they house uh, CPIC. And CPIC is the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium. This is an international group. And we write guidelines on what to do with genomic information if you have it. We avoid the really hard question of here's when you should get the genomic information. The idea here is if we tell clinicians here's what to do with the data, they will figure out how to integrate it in their practice in a much better way than if I say, you should do this and this and this. It's very limited, but if they get used to it, they will find out the best ways to use it in their practice. So one of the resources they use are these variant, uh, the variant lookup tables. And so here you have each uh, genotype that we looked at, and then it's translated into the star alleles. And so the reason why the star alleles are good is you'll notice that, say, star 3D, it actually contains three different variants. So instead of having to remember three different genotypes or three different RSIDs, we have one term to describe the whole particular uh, gene for that patient. So it's a little bit easier to handle. Um, it actually turns out that the star was probably the worst thing that we could have used to name these because in many systems that is a wild card, meaning anything that's before it or after it is, is fine. And so it becomes very hard to look it up. Um, and it's actually, in some clinical implementations, has represented a huge challenge as to how do we get around this star allele? Um, and do we need to use some other standard to be able to get it done? And then we lead into standards of standards of standards, and then you no longer have a standard, as Jack said earlier. So when you want to translate the data to the clinician, this, the, this is a, a picture from a lab report that a, a, a commercial lab in the United States uses, and I'll show you another one. Here, they're taking it from the gene point of view. So they're telling you CYP2D6 as the, the anchor point, and then they tell you the medications that are involved. 
For some clinicians, this is wonderful because they know the gene they're concerned about and they go right there. But for other clinicians who are less familiar with genetics, when you lead with the gene, they have no idea. Their eyes glaze over, they fall asleep, they stop paying attention to you, and the data is no longer useful. So some labs have went to just reporting about the drugs and trying to give you a context uh, specific idea about what to do. So red, yellow, green, that's pretty simple. Green means go, use it. Yellow, caution, red, stop, don't use it. And you can see that there are actually no genetics on this page, right? It's just drugs. So that's a little bit easier for clinicians. These are just two ways of representing the data. I know there's at least a third, which is taking it from a disease point of view, and there's probably a fourth, fifth, and sixth that we don't know yet, and this represents an opportunity that as we give this knowledge to the end user, the clinician, we, as Jack said, the proof is in the pudding, we can find out what their appetite is for that and maybe learn new data to push into new knowledge and represent it in a different way, right? Continue to grow and meet the needs of our providers. So when we think about interpreting the data, most people think, oh, it's one thing. It's either laboratory interpretation or it's clinical interpretation, but when you're designing the program, it's going to be both, and this raises the need for collaboration because no one person is gonna know all of these answers. You're gonna to have to work with a group of people to get these done. All right, so returning the data. How do you return the data in the medical record? Uh, here are some screenshots for how St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which is where I previously was, returns the data for physicians. So one is, it's in the medical record as a laboratory result, like I would go if I wanted to see somebody's uh, serum sodium for the day. The pharmacogenomic data is here, represented in star alleles, and then a much longer description. I tried to do this at North Shore, and they laughed at me because nobody has time to read all of this text. It's too much, they don't care about this. When you're in front of a patient, you don't have time to sit here and read all of this data. You want something much, much shorter. There are also interruptive alerts that you can do where if a provider is trying to uh, prescribe a high-risk drug to a patient that has a high-risk genotype and you don't want them to do it, you pop something up in their face and say, hey, think about doing something different. And one of the interesting things you can do with clinical decision support is you don't just have to rely on the genetics, you can also think about some other parameters that might be important. So this particular one is, um, may suggest that you want to order a test for a patient. Well, if I'm gonna order a genotype, the patient has to have enough DNA in their blood, so they have enough, have to have enough well, white blood cells to um, justify ordering that test. Because if their white blood cell count is less than um, 1,000, you're probably not gonna get enough DNA out of that sample to run the test and get an answer, so you wouldn't wanna do that. If they've had a recent whole blood transfusion, you may actually get the donor's DNA and not the patient's, so that result's not gonna be useful. So you can begin to make these very, very smart, but you might make them too smart and where it becomes cumbersome and you don't actually get any value out of the particular alert or value out of all the extra work that you did. You've got to find the sweet spot for your organization. And here's a third way, and this is the way we represented it at North Shore, is we went at it from the drug point of view, that thing that physicians are most comfortable with, and we've distilled the answer down to, this is about eight words, right? So amitriptyline is a problem, what is the problem? An increased risk of side effects. What do we want you to do? We want you to decrease the dose. And then you can see at the very corner here, we finally give you the genetics, because we do think they're important, we think you should want to look at them, so we give them to you. And then we also have more information here in the blue, and you can click on this and get a much longer um, readout where it's paragraphs and references if you want to dive in and learn more about the information. But you have to come at it in a layered approach because we don't know what any one clinician wants. There are multiple clinicians in an organization. We need to support all of their needs. Okay, so a little, I've talked about North Shore a lot. I struggled where to put this in the presentation, so I put it here uh, to describe a little bit about North Shore. It's a community hospital system, so no university is directly tied to us, so we don't have a, a campus with college students right next to us. Uh, it's a four-hospital uh, four system with about a 1,000 beds across the system. We have a lot of uh, physician offices, and so that's really important. Uh, it represents about 120 emergency room visits a year, so we have a pretty good patient volume. And we have an integrated medical record, both inpatient and outpatient. So unlike Taipei Medical University, we don't have three systems, we have one. 
So this makes it much easier for when I come up with a tool, I only have to build it one in one system and everybody has access to it. And this allows patients to do the testing outpatient and then use that data while they're inpatient. So how do we structure this? Pharmacogenomics is a part of a much larger um, entity called the Center for Personalized Medicine. There's not a building, you can't go to this wonderful building that has the name Personalized Medicine over it. It's just a virtual center where we have teleconferences and things like that. We have molecular pathology where we're generating the laboratory data. So we're doing this in-house both on the uh, tumor side as well as inherited diseases and pharmacogenomics using multiple uh, instruments and multiple techniques. We have clinics in all of the areas where we think pharmaco or where we think genomics is ready for clinical care. We have a center for medical genetics that's been around for the 90s. Most hospital systems have that of some sort. We have one in oncology. We have a pharmacogenomic clinic, which is pretty unique. We have uh, cardiology, neurology, and diabetes. So what you begin to see is genomics is not a silo, but it's something that flavors every part of the healthcare enterprise. So these clinics can do a lot of great work, but if we don't integrate it into the system where everybody else can benefit from it, it's been a waste of time. So we work on systematic integration, and then we have a huge effort in education, because I can build all the tools we want, we can do all the really cool nifty things, but if nobody knows what it means or knows that it's there, they're never going to utilize your resources, or they may use them wrong and lead to bad patient outcomes. And then at the bottom, we have research, and so we're still continuing to do research for how to best implement this, how to discover new genetic entities that are going to be important. But the exciting thing about North Shore is it's mostly driven off clinical care, saying genomics is ready for prime time and we can use this in patient care today. We don't have to relegate it to a research setting. So this is some structure about how we set up the pharmacogenomics uh, program. I told you that having buy-in from the top down is really important, and so this is what uh, this figure represents. This is our structure and governance. So we have, on the clinical side, uh, we report to the Medical Executive Committee and the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. So this is where we get the clinical buy-in for what we're doing with pharmacogenomics. And then on the other side, we have the administrative buy-in. So when, I wanna, when the clinicians say, hey, I wanna see the data in this way, I can go to the administrators and say, I need the resources to be able to do this thing your clinicians want. So it's really important that we report to both ends so that we have support and we know what we want to do as well. It'd be, we could have all the resources in the world, but if nobody wants to use it, then it's going to be a waste of time. The pharmacogenomics subcommittee is divided up into many different working groups to focus on the key core components. So clinical decision support, or CDS, is definitely going to be something very important to us. Translating the laboratory data to something that we can use with CDS is important, so that's the bioinformatics. We have to generate the data, that's our genetic testing group. Education, you can imagine you walk around the circle, pretty descriptive about what each group does. And then we have an ad hoc group for any new things that come up, for example, legal, ethical uh, issues that might be important, social issues, where we currently are engaging the community to find out, are we doing the genetic testing that they want, or is there something else that they want to see? because we're here to support a community. So those groups work on these core components. We have genetic testing, so this would be the generation of the data from the consumer going back to uh, Jack's presentation. We have um, the data to knowledge, so that's the genomic repository going into the clinical database or the knowledge database in CDS, and then taking that knowledge into practice, that's going to be the EHR and then taking from practice back to the consumer going to education. So his model, I didn't see his slides before this, but it fits very, very well into uh, this particular process. So we have a clinic, I'll just speed through this very quickly. We created it because our community wanted it. It was uh, patients and providers who wanted to use this data. And that large systematic rollout takes a long time. So this was an initial step to get it going so we could support people. It's two visits. It costs about $450 to do it. Most of our patients who want to do pharmacogenomics have no problem paying this amount of money. Uh, this has been a shock to many people because $450 is a lot, but patients understand the value of this, and this is where education becomes very important. So who's using our clinic? 
you can see now that it's mostly primary care physicians. So this means they could be using this data for any given condition, but they are the gatekeepers at, in the US health care system. So it's appropriate to use this. So we're using it early on in patients' treatment. So I just talked to you a lot about what we're doing in North Shore. I am not the only one working on it. These are all of the people that work with me. Without this team, I wouldn't be able to do any of the work that I do. They make it a pleasure to come to work every day. They make it so I can come give presentations like this. They've been working very hard. And I think something that's very interesting here is if you look at the professions of every one of these people, you can see that there's physicians, pharmacists, administrators, nurses, genetic counselors, pathologists. It really does take a team to get it done. Um, I'll just briefly go over this. Updating the system is going to be a really big challenge. We're going to learn new information, but we've got to figure out how to integrate it. The new information may be on the research discovery side of this new drug gene pair, but it also might be on the consumer side of, I now want to know this about my genetics, and we have to figure out how to deliver that back to both the provider and the patient. Uh, leveraging outside resources, let me show you this graph. This is the number of articles that are published any given year that uh, tag themselves for pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetics. So you can see we're hovering at about 3,000 articles. That's a lot of data to try to crunch and figure out how to put into practice. So we need to use outside resources to get this done because every hospital can't do this on their own. They have to have an outside um, entity to do it. Maybe it's CPIC, but maybe it's something else and we probably need to figure that out. And then the really fun stuff is pharmacogenomics is just the first stepping stone to the much larger goal of precision medicine. So thinking about risk score um, interventions, so you're looking at multiple genes related to somebody's risk of a disease, and then can we move into the other omics? Can we move into proteomics, metabolomics, the microbiome? All of these things are going to play a role, and maybe once we understand all of that, we can get to the day where I can say, this patient needs 81 milligrams, this patient needs 79 milligrams, and have a way to deliver that to them. So hopefully we'll get there, we're just not quite there, yeah? And so key takeaways, collaboration, very, very important. You need a large team to be able to do this. Most of the slides I showed you had nothing to do with genetics, and that's because many of the processes that you need to do this already exist in your healthcare system. You just have to identify them, because all this is is bringing up a new clinical service with new data that people aren't used to. And pharmacogenomics and personalized medicine is going to work best when we integrate it into the physician's workflow so that one day they are practicing routine care that has been flavored by genetics or precision medicine, and they're not saying, I practice precision medicine, right? They say, I'm a doctor and I take care of my patients. It just happens to be flavored by genomics and other ones. All right, thank you, I'll take some questions.